I'm Cash Valley Prepper, and this video is going to be about uh, first aid components and medical components for our pocket survival kits. It's uh, one more video in the series on pocket survival kits and contents, and we'll get started. Um, so the main main injuries uh, that people are exposed to in survival ordeals are exposure, cuts, or lacerations, um, blisters, um, bleeding, uh, shock, um, then longer term can be infection, um, also, uh, you know, wound management, blisters, eye particles and splinters uh, are probably the the principal thing. So when it comes to exposure, um, treating exposure-related injuries uh, for heat exposure, you know, we we talked under uh, water a little bit about oral rehydration therapy, and Cerolite, which is a rice-based oral electrolyte drink mix. And it has a few calories to it. Um, and ORT can also be uh, improvised out of uh, salt and sugar. Um, cold, cold exposure uh, can be uh, treated with glucose, uh, a readily uh, usable sugar that can get uh, cold uh, patients shivering again. Um, also, uh, white petrolatum is good for uh, burns once they've cooled down, um, and cold uh, and wind-based injuries. It's a skin protectant. Um, Next, um, after exposure, we have cuts and lacerations. Um, so in a, we can't fit a whole lot in a pocket survival kit, but you can have uh, tape, you know, probably flat pack, not rolls of tape, and scissors and nonstick gauze. And with those three things, you can cut you can create any shape of bandage that you need. So um, it uh, takes up a lot less space to put to carry these three things than it does to carry a whole ton of different bandages you may or may not use. Um, triple antibiotic ointment uh, helps control infection. Um, if bleeding needs to be stopped. Um, there are some small uh, he hemostatic, you know, if, you can't, if it can't be stopped with direct pressure uh, with a regular gauze pad, then you can move up to hemostatic uh, gauze, gauze impregnated with a hemostatic agent, um, or of course a tourniquet using a belt or uh, something in your your survival self recovery f core layer like a bandana and uh, an object like a metal pen you can twist you know roll the bandana up and create a tourniquet um, so direct pressure also um, medical cotton um, is great uh, don't uh, keep checking and removing gauze. Just pile more, more uh, material on top of it, and keep applying direct pressure. Um, with bandaging, um, with cuts and lacerations, um, you may want to include something like stair strips. Um, I've had great luck with stair strips. I've used them on uh, 
wound on cuts that I that should have had stitches and they did just fine. Uh, but I think the reason I had good success is that I used benzoin tincture with them. And ben benzoin, um, it's probably the one of the things I see left out of survival kits in general that I definitely would include. Usually uh, you'll see it in these single use break glass in case of emergency type containers here. But you know, once you crack them open, they're done. You know, they're a single use, they're gonna dry up as soon as, as soon as they're open. So I package it in a little vial and I just use a tiny bit of medical cotton. And when I say a tiny bit, I'm, I'm, I mean it. It's gotta be just a little tiny bit um, or create like a cotton swab using a little stick with it because it'll soak up a quarter of the contents of this vial in just a second, you know, and before you know it, it's half gone, you know. But um, a vial like this is good for many, many, many applications, not just one, and, and it takes up pretty much the same amount of space, you know, depending on how it's packaged, maybe a tiny bit more but you get a whole lot more applications. And benzoin tincture is a skin protectant that um, will help the adhesive uh, materials like stair strips and bandages and um, moleskin stick much better. You know, with, with this, they'll stay on for days, and that's important when you're... Uh, when you're in a high activity, uh, doing a lot and, or you're in a survival ordeal in the outdoors, you need, need that stuff to stay on when you're walking long distances and working hard. So that's, that's a very important benzoin tincture. Um, after, uh, I get you also with, uh, with lacerations you can go to sutures and just your sewing needle you could uh, sterilize it with a lighter or fire and use thread in in place of sutures um, it's an option you know I, I would probably uh, disinfect the thread first uh, because it's obviously not sterile um, and you could do that by creating a wound irrigation solution, which is the next thing on, on our next thing up. So, um, wound irrigation in a pocket survival kit, you can't be carrying around syringes and pouches of iodine and things. So, um, what, but what you can bring is a tiny, uh, eyedropper bottle of uh, iodine tincture and or a tiny uh, tiny little vial of potassium permanganate and either of these will uh, you can create a wound irrigation solution from it's be it's better if you have uh, the 10 percent uh, povidone iodine than the 2% tincture, but um, there are instructions for improvising wound irrigation out of either of these. Um, and you can irrigate the wound by uh, creating the solution in your water bag and then just perforating it with a safety pin. Uh, just, you know, in probably one or two holes, three holes, you won't want a lot. And then after you're done, you can tape it over with 100 mile an hour tape or duct tape or whatever you're carrying. And you can still use your water bag, but um, idea for wound irrigation. Um, the bag is also an imp impermeable layer and is, you know, these bags in particular, and also the, MRE hot beverage bags, they're 
sealed hot when they're made. So these these bags are about as close to sterile as you'd get so uh, in the field. So if you needed to even seal like a, a sucking chest wound, uh, you could use that and uh, some petrolatum jelly, or you could use that uh, nonstick gauze with this under that and create some petrolatum gauze uh, for a sucking chest wound. You know, hopefully you don't get that in a survival situation because uh, chances, you know, in a your chances would not be great in an austere setting. Um, after band, uh, bandaging and uh, cuts and bleeding and wound irrigation, um, those are the more serious things. We also have um, eye particles uh, is another thing I'd like to talk about briefly. Um, this is an eye particle remover and it's just a little tool for removing eye particles and it has two heads on it. This one is a, a magnet and this one is a loop. It's just, uh, you can see that in the camera, it's a monofilament loop of just essentially fishing line. So do you think you could improvise something like that out of your pocket survival kit? I bet you might be able to because you probably have fishing line and you may have a magnet such as this uh, general direction uh, seer compass created with two rod magnets. You just mark the pole that points north and you sandwich them on a piece of long piece of thread, a couple meters, suspend it and it'll point north. But you could also use it to pull ferrous uh, metal eye particles out of the eye with that blunt surface of the magnet there. Or you could make a small loop out of fishing line and remove particles that the magnet can't get. So uh, next up, uh, we have blisters, um, especially in a self-recovery or E and E situation. Blisters, you know, if you lose the ability to move, you're not going to be able to self-recover, obviously. So, um, with blisters, you want the benzoin tincture and mole skin. Um, generally, you don't you don't want to you want to leave the blister in place and you don't want to puncture it. Um, but if you, if it's ruptured or it's just so big that you can't walk, you could puncture it with a sterilized uh, safety pin or needle. Or a, uh, you could cut the, debride it, taking the excess tissue away with a scalpel. Um, so, next up we have um, medications um, and pocket survival kits are so small they can't include a lot of medications. Um, if you put medication in vials like this, it's going to take up a lot, you know, a lot of space in a pocket survival kit. Um, so, um, an alternative is to just put them in a small Ziploc bag all together. Um, as these are, this is a Z pack here. It's the azithromycin, which is the antibiotic uh, that is only like six doses. Um, so, that's about the only one you can fit in a pocket survival kit as, as far as oral antibiotics go. But if you do this, be sure uh, that you have create a legend that has the, uh, the 
different medications listed and how to use them and the dosage and how to identify the pills because they're all mixed up like that. You'd also want to in include uh, the extra printouts of your prescriptions. Uh, you can just cut them down to size and put them in there, but you don't want to separate these from the prescription label. You can see there's one in, in this one. Um, and I'm not going to put mine out here and dox myself, but um, I, I would include those in your pocket survival kit just in case it gets searched. Um, so, uh, oral as far as oral meds, that's what I suggest. Um, I would also include some first aid instructions. Um, and, you know, even if you are positive, you know what to do in every situation, it may be someone else, not you, using your kit to save you. So do include instructions. And uh, if you're suffering from dehydration and cold and injuries and hunger and sleep deprivation and things, you won't be operating at 100%. And you might be able to use a guide. Um, as far as instruments, you'll need light, um, a lens, and a mirror are important. Um, if you're treating a part of the body that you can't see, you need a mirror to treat that. This mirror can also be cut uh, and used as a dental mirror. Um, and you, if you could also uh, file down lock picks in your kit to use as dental instruments if you needed to. Um, this is a lens uh, for stickers, which is something we didn't talk about yet. Um, I, I grew up in Arizona, so I have a lot of uh, experience, unfortunately, with, <laughs> with cactus. And so um, sometimes it'll go right into the bone and you need pliers to get it out. Some of the tougher ones like staghorn choya. Um, these are tweezers, really good tweezers. Get, um, like these are good to have. Um, these are the, uh, oh, what, what are they called? Sliver grippers. And this is the military issue version of the slip, sliver gripper. Um, and they're good for glockids uh, from the little fine hair-like uh, stickers from Prickly Pear. But these are good for like the bit, you know, big choya needles. You'll need something more like pliers to get those out if they're in the bone. Um, also, uh, the lens comes in handy for that. Um, and if you have a comb in your EDC, that's a good way to remove, uh, cho you know, choya links if they get on your leg um, or wherever you get them. Um, it's good to use a comb to get those off because if you try to grab them with your hand they'll just stick you in the hand and then you, you have another problem um, one last thing I didn't get to under exposure um, obviously the shelter items would help with exposure but a blanket also is needed necessary to treat shock um, which is one of the three killers along with uh, airway obstruction and uncontrolled bleeding. So be sure you can treat those three things. So I uh, hope some of this helped. Uh, thanks for watching. And this is Cash Valley Prepper.